Hi, this is Tommy Hodgins, and there is a great set of questions on the Container Query Use Cases repository that kind of get at the question of why do we need this spec in the first place? So I'm going to take a crack at answering each one of these uh, with a few different examples or a few different points that I think uh, kind of illustrates or shines a light on uh, how these could be useful. So I'm going to hop over to my notes and we'll get started. So what kind of layout are people trying to achieve? And so in the context of container queries or element queries, I think the main things that uh, CSS authors and web developers are looking for is they want the ability to build uh, complex layouts, um, especially the idea of breaking a larger layout down into smaller components, or if you've heard of uh, atomic design, like Brad Frost style, not like Tachyon style. I think the idea is to um, simplify responsive design by thinking about individual parts of a design and their responsive styles rather than trying to uh, put everything all in one layout and then only with the ability to base things off of the viewport with um, trying to make everything respond even if it doesn't necessarily relate to the viewport width. And so another big one is self-contained modularized components. And this is especially big in the JavaScript world where you've got React and Vue, uh, Polymer, and things where people want to put all of their HTML, all of their styles, all of their JavaScript together into one file or uh, one group of files that can be imported into any project, imported into any layout. Um, but currently with the responsive styles being tied to the viewport, it's a little bit hard to do that. And the last one is when you have layouts where something inside the design or something inside the layout changes uh, completely different from any kind of viewport change. So I've got an example of this. This is one of the first EQCSS demos that I built in 2015. And I just tested out a couple things. Um, there's a little sidebar that toggles in and out. So this is an example of a change where um, my layout is changing. You can see the width of this content in here changes based on toggling the sidebar, but there's absolutely no viewport difference. If we make this narrow enough, there isn't going to be enough room for these two widgets to be side by side. So they will stack. But what you'll notice is They've stacked here. If we remove the sidebar, there's enough room for them to go side by side. So it's almost like the breakpoint for this, if it was tied to the viewport, would be off by the width of the sidebar, depending on the status of the sidebar. We need some kind of a breakpoint that will kind of respond to the space available, which in this case is the width of this main area, which isn't always equal to the width of the viewport. So how are you able to achieve these layouts today? So before the talk of element queries or before the talk of uh, trying to add this functionality to CSS, the pretty much the only way that people were working with it was by using JavaScript to watch or listen to events and assign different classes. And so that meant that you had to, uh, in your CSS style sheet, you had all of the styles that applied all the time, but then for each additional uh, kind of, I'll call them element query states, or for each potential uh, variation, you would have to put kind of like a flat rendering of everything that would be in that style sheet and you just kind of prefix it with a class like sidebar open or something. And so what you end up with in your CSS is a big file with a lot of different state-based representations or um, it, it can get a little bit messy to try to organize or understand everything that's going on in that CSS style sheet. Another way that people have tried to do element based breakpoints has been by using iframes, including there's a whole blog post and workflow for iframeify. So this is something that has been done, it's been written about, but it's just not a perfect solution. So with iframeify, you have a node and then a JavaScript library that replaces the node with an iframe containing that content. 
So the problem with iframes is that they are slow. Um, we'll get into that here. Uh, using complex SAS math formulas to try to find some kind of a relationship between the viewport and what you're actually styling. So the best example of complex CSS, uh, SAS math formula I can think of is CSS locks. So with these, each blog post has a different formula and they're so convoluted that sometimes I've seen entire blog posts where people are just trying to remember uh, what their existing formula actually stood for and what the numbers meant. So this is the type of thing I'm talking about. So here you know that somehow the viewport width is related to the line height, but there's an awful lot of other stuff. And so this is one that's possible, but there's a lot of attempts like this where uh, it's not quite as good. It, it can get pretty convoluted pretty fast. And another way that people are trying to achieve uh, component-based styles or component-based breakpoints is using Shadow DOM, which isn't in every browser. So you're, again, still relying on JavaScript, ultimately, uh, to help you with that if you use that in production. So why isn't Resize Observer enough? And my gut instinct is it is. It, it, like, I feel like if you were a browser maker and you've been working on Resize Observer for the past few years, now that we're just on the edge of being able to use it, it must feel disheartening for people to say, you know, we need this functionality in CSS and everything. You say, why not use what we, you know, we've been working so hard to prepare for you. And I think that we will end up using it. I think it'll get a lot of use for exactly this uh, use case, but it's all going to be from JavaScript. And so I think the functionality is key. I think it's the right feature for everybody, but it's only exposed through JavaScript. So it's the wrong UI for CSS authors. So I think part of what we're trying to do is provide some kind of a, uh, you know, just in the same way that a media query exposes the inner width and the inner height that JavaScript is aware of, but in a way that CSS authors can take advantage of and work with without having to write JavaScript, anything you could do with a width-based media query or a height-based media query, you could do with JavaScript uh, by testing inner width or inner height. Uh, why isn't inner width or inner height enough? Why do we need media queries? I feel like the answer is the same kind of thing. So why not just use iframes? Um, I showed the iframeify library. It's not that great for production, but it, it is really good for uh, previewing a component at different widths for development or previewing a component for different widths in something like a style guide where performance isn't a big issue. Communication between the component and the rest of the page isn't a big issue. And you're more or less just previewing one thing at different widths. So the truth is that iframes are everything that we need and more. The problem is that they end to they end up slowing things down because each iframe acts like its own little document with all of its own events and and everything else. And so by the time you know if you have fifty or hundred of these things on a page, um, you start to notice that the the main page is a little bit sluggish. Uh, if there was a way that you could have a thin iframe or an iframe that wasn't excluded from the document, like I feel like that's kind of like. Uh, almost into the Shadow DOM use cases or what that's trying to accomplish. And so I just think iframes are just too much. Uh, too much, too slow. And another big thing is that the content inside the iframe, there is a way that you can pass messages from the document to a document inside an iframe and from the iframed document out into the parent document. But it, you can't say that that's simpler than having everything all in one page. So it does get a little bit more convoluted anytime you're trying to make these different components that may live in iframes work together or work with your original page. And on the back end, it takes a lot more doing to put that kind of a layout together. Um, it's, it's doable, but there's a minimum complexity that creeps in anytime you have that kind of a workflow. So why aren't the plugins enough? So the plugins are kind of enough for now. Uh, we can get support back to an IE7. We can get support in every browser that we need today. Um, and the performance is okay. 
I've been using plugins to do these ideas since 2015 in production. Um, and I'm seeing just on uh, my most popular plugin, there's, there's an adoption rate uh, of more than one website per day, it seems. Like now I, I get about 10 or 13 new sites popping up using it uh, every week. And so people are trying it, testing it, seeing that these plugins are good enough to use in production today, but that doesn't mean that they're the best that they can be. So I think that for a long time, even if we specify support, even if uh, browsers add support, uh, we're still gonna rely on plugins for a long time in the future to make sure that the same functionality is exposed in older browsers and to make sure that um, whatever features that we come up with, we can actually use. So one thing that I think is going to change if we're able to specify uh, something here is I'm, I'm hoping that the plugins that we use in the present and the near future can all be standardized to the set of functionality that may eventually be coming in the browser. And so even today, um, the plugins we have aren't enough because they're different. Even if we can just standardize the plugins that we're using, that would go a long way to helping the situation as it currently is. So what is it that a native solution will give us over the status quo? So it will vastly improve the expressiveness and the responsiveness of the styles that you can write in CSS. There's already a lot of ways that CSS can be written um, with these conditional dynamic rules that get turned on and off, um, most of them through either a pseudo class or through um, some kind of an at rule like at supports or at media. Um, and this would go a long way to expanding that. The other reason is that almost certainly something that is built into the browser uh, could be perform better than any of the JavaScript plugins that we have. And um, even if they matched the performance of the JavaScript plugins, it would kind of lock in the best way of doing it and make it so that you couldn't go off the rails as easily or do the things that would perform uh, less good. Another way that it would help is it would improve the reference teaching and tooling by providing a standard that everybody could be writing toward, reading toward, working with. Um, right now, as far as I know, nobody has any kind of a plugin that has proper uh, syntax highlighting or nobody has a linter or a validator for their uh, queries. So each of us using the idea has our own understanding, our own set of features, our own syntax, uh, our own way of including this functionality. And even people who are doing the same thing, we can't just hop onto somebody else's project and immediately know what they're doing or how to do what we want to do. Um, right now, there's just a diversity of ideas. And so that makes it a little bit confusing. How do you write a tutorial? Or how do you look up? You know, I want to change something based on the height. Uh, you're going to find a lot of different plugins with a lot of different ideas that all work, but they don't work the same way and they don't quite necessarily do the same thing. So the other one is that right now there are thousands of sites out there with different plugins. And so a native solution gives us a standard. Um, so I, I just think of, imagine if the idea of media queries uh, was out there as an idea, but everybody had their own JavaScript plugin for doing media queries. Uh, it would be a little bit chaotic, and even though you would know what they were doing and even a bit of how they were doing it, you could see why that kind of a, a chaotic uh, mixture of the, the research, the ideas, the techniques, the theory, and a non-standard application of those ideas could get a little bit messy. So I think those are my thoughts on these questions, uh, kind of answering why do we need these and why isn't what we have enough. So hopefully that helps um, answer some of those. I'd be really curious to hear any more questions like this and I can write or try to give examples if that would also help. Um, hopefully everything has been uh, clearer. 
and uh, looking forward to the discussion that pops up and the ideas. And mostly I'm just looking forward to being able to write a solution or write a plugin or write an article that is, is official, the way that we have decided to do it or the way that we will be doing it in the future, even if it's not implemented right away. It'll be really exciting to have uh, just a standard solution to these problems. So I hope you have a great day.